One of the frustrations of reading the Bible is, um, you know, they, they don't always answer the questions we have. For instance, we read about some of these great lives and nobody ever thought to write down what these people look like and some of the physical descriptions. For instance, four different people wrote the life story of Jesus. We have it in the Gospels. And nobody thought to say, and this is what he looked like, or this is how tall he was. Or, you know, we have a little image here or there, like John the Baptist, the kind of clothes he wore and, and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, we have a lot of art that kind of you know, some artist depiction through the years that kind of shape uh, maybe what these folks look like. But we're talking about the life of Paul here. Uh, we're in this amazing series about this amazing life, the Apostle Paul. We do have a description, uh, not in scripture, but uh, from a document about, uh, that was written about 150 AD of what the Apostle Paul looked like. Let's put this up on the screen. A man small in size, bald-headed, bow-legged, well-built, with eyebrows meeting, unibrow, rather long nose, and full of grace. <laughs> All right. So Paul probably didn't do the amazing things he did because of his good looks. It was probably something else going on. It was that full of grace part there. And, uh, you know, we've been describing uh, the different seasons of Paul's life. We've been using some different words. One word was privilege. He was born to an upper middle class family, studied under the best rabbis of his day in Jerusalem itself. Uh, he was, lived a life of passion. He was passionate for the purity of the Pharisee religion, uh, sect of Jesus. Judaism, so much so that he was willing to use everything up to and including violence to enforce the purity of the faith. And that's what he was doing as he unleashed a wave of persecution as a young man upon the young church of Jesus Christ. And he was on his way to Damascus to round up followers of Jesus when Jesus himself encounters him and changes his life uh, forever. He's found himself blind in Damascus, was baptized, became a believer. There was about 10 years there where where he was understanding, the, studying the scriptures on his own, preaching where he could, but not really an apostle in any sense of the word. But his friend Barnabas called him to Antioch in Syria, where there was an outbreak of Gentile Christian Christianity, Gentile believers. And for this Pharisee, he, God stretched him well outside of his comfort zone. And he saw the grace of God was at work in the Gentiles, just as it had been among Jewish followers of Jesus. And he set out on a missionary journey with his good friend Barnabas and uh, went to Jerusalem and made sure they were lined up, that this isn't just a Jewish church and a Gentile church. This is one church of Jesus Christ. And he launched out on a second mission journey. Everything went wrong. He fell out with his good friend Barnabas. He, uh, the Holy Spirit stopped him from preaching in Ephesus, in, uh, in, excuse me, in Asia like he thought he should, uh, but did call him to uh, Europe where he was at Thessalonica and Athens we looked at next week. And on his way back to Jerusalem, he was always checking in with Jerusalem. He was delivering offerings to the church there. He always wanted to give reports about what was going on among the Gentiles so that it stayed one movement, one church. He visited very briefly uh, Ephesus, which was a major city, but only got to stay for a little while. And then he went back to Jerusalem, but he made his way on a third missionary journey as quick as he could. And he ended up in Ephesus and he would spend more time in this place than almost any. And so as we, we're going to wrap this series up next week, but today I thought we'd talk about Paul's ministry in this place called Ephesus. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we're so thankful for uh, your word today. It gives us light and understanding and truth. It shapes our lives. It shows us how to live. It shows us the power by which we have to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Ephesus was the capital of the Roman province uh, that they called Asia. Okay? And, uh, and Ephesus was one of the top five populated cities in the Roman Empire. So this was a major city. In fact, you can visit the ruins of Ephesus today. It has been reconstructed from the ruins as much as they could. Uh, some of us are thinking about going to some of these places next year, next fall probably, uh, to visit some of the sites of the journey of Paul. Come go with us. One of the places I'm sure we'll want to get to is Ephesus. And it's been reconstructed so you can almost feel like you were there in Paul's day. There's another picture here that uh, shows the library itself. 
Paracelsus. It was a learning center. Uh, the library rivaled the famous library at Alexandria, for instance. Um, it was a place uh, famous for one of the wonders of the ancient world, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which was the temple to Artemis or Diana, as she's also known. You know, last week we looked at... Uh, we looked at Athens, and up on the Acropolis there, there's the Parthenon. The temple to Artemis was four times as large as the, the Parthenon, if you can imagine that. And it was definitely a major landmark and a major source of civic pride. They were the headquarters for the worship of the goddess uh, Diana. They, there were other kinds of worship going on there. Uh, they had uh, a, a growing, a newer but growing uh, emperor cult. Uh, one, the ultimate kiss up in their ancient Roman world is to tell the emperor, we don't just love you, we worship you. We're building temples to you, we're worshiping you as a god, and, uh, and so send money, please, and send, send support, right? Because we just love you that much. And uh, also, it was known for its occult practices and magic arts and that, that, kind, of, that kind of thing. So very, very uh, interesting uh, religious landscape there in Ephesus. And so Paul arrives for the second time, and uh, we learn about this in Acts chapter 19. Let's jump into the story here. While Apollo wa Apollos was at Corinth. Now Apollos, we meet him earlier in the book of Acts. He is somebody that knew something about Jesus, but not everything about Jesus. And two of Paul's friends, Aquila and Priscilla, filled him in and, and brought him up to speed on the full story of Jesus. And he was a guy that itinerated around. He and Paul kind of ran parallel to one another, an amazing teacher of the Bible, knew the Old Testament inside and out. And so he was another traveling uh, apostolic figure at that time. Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of Christians have lived their whole life and they could say that same thing, that I didn't really, we didn't really talk about the Holy Spirit in the church that I went to. And, uh, and so Paul asked, what baptism did you receive? Well, we received John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. So this, this is the starting of the church in Ephesus. 12 people that had heard something about Jesus, but they had missed Pentecost. They missed the part about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And Paul was not going to let them go a minute longer without having an opportunity to meet the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what, the Holy Spirit is our power source as if you're going to live a Christian life. The Holy Spirit is our direction if you're going to live a Christian life. The Holy Spirit is the one that whispers to you and nudges you uh, on in your life. The Holy Spirit, as Rogine uh, uh, beautifully testified today, is our source of joy, a release of joy in our heart. I heard one preacher say, somebody asked her one time, do you need the, be, do you need the Holy Spirit to go to heaven? She said, honey, you need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart, okay? <laughs> uh, you're going to need the Holy Spirit. And so Paul's ministry in Ephesus is going to be marked by the praying that people will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, there, and, and this, is, this is typical of Paul. He didn't just talk it, you know, he didn't just preach. He gave a demonstration. In fact, he's, he's going to write to the Corinthians in chapter 1. He says this, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. He's not just trying to manipulate them into something here, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith may not rest in human wisdom, but on God's power. This is, a, this is a message with power, and the power is the Holy Spirit, a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's willing to fill anyone that opens, uh, any believer in Jesus Christ that's willing to open their heart, a release of God's power. We see that power in Acts chapter 19. We give three little vignettes. Uh, I want you to read this for yourself this afternoon as you go home. Open your Bible and read about this. One thing that happened is uh, there were, uh, uh, people would take uh, claws from the Apostle Paul 
and take them to people that were sick and they would be healed. Now I'm reading a biography on Paul uh, by N.T. Wright. And uh, he suggests that these claws, these weren't things that Paul was handing out. Here, somebody can be healed if you take something that's touched me. These were maybe even the, the sweat rags that he used when he worked. You know, when Paul goes to a place, he's not sponging off the people. He's working. And he's, his trade is a tent maker. He, he's taking his tools of his trade with him. He's buying his raw materials locally. Tents were a big business, probably his family business he learned back in, in Tarsus. Uh, you know, soldiers needed tents. Uh, businesses needed awnings in the marketplaces. They covered, they created shade over, over the marketplace items like we do today. And, uh, and that, was his, uh, that was his trade. And it was, he worked by the sweat of his brow. And people started to pick up these rags and they'd take them and people would be healed. The Holy Spirit even touched his perspiration, which is kind of only mentioned in the Bible of that kind of thing. Uh, there, were, um, there were a group, of, there was a priest named Sceva that had seven sons. And these sons were kind of uh, amateur exorcists. And they would pray for people. And they were really impressed with the power that Paul had to do this kind of thing. And so they, they went to this one guy who was oppressed by the devil. And they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, we cast you out. And the voice comes from this man Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And beats those seven boys uh, senseless. They run off naked and screaming into the, into the street. And so it tells you something about Paul. Uh, the demons knew Jesus. They, they would point him out when Jesus was, hey, this is the son of God. And they came to know Paul. You know, somebody said we ought to live the kind of life when we get up in the morning, the devil says, oh, no, they're up. You know? Paul lived that kind of, that kind of life. An old preacher from Alabama, a friend of mine, used to preach a sermon called, Are You Known in Hell? Okay? Paul was even known in hell. Um, but you couldn't fake this thing. You couldn't say in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Um, another thing that happened is people turned aside from their past and turned to Jesus Christ. I mentioned the occult was such a big thing in Ephesus. And uh, we're told in the book of Acts that people brought their books. A book is a precious thing now, is a precious thing then especially because it, these were all handwritten and they were very expensive and they brought these occult manuals and books and incantations and they, and they burned them. Uh, I can't think of too many book burnings. They, they weren't burning anybody else's books. They were burning their own books and it was a sign of their repentance and turning away from the darkness to, to the light. And, and Paul stayed in Ephesus long enough. He stayed there quite a long time. Uh, he, was, he started out as he always did in the synagogue and after about three months gets kicked out of the synagogue. This was typical, this was his normal pattern. And he rented a hall called the Hall of Tyrannus and he used that as his place of preaching in a, in a cosmopolitan place like Ephesus. I think Paul realized that he could win a lot of people to Jesus Christ because a lot of people traveled through and he could go to them, but they came to him in Ephesus. They were a lot of business people, a lot of people traveled through. And so he could have a wonderful min ministry to that whole area by staying in Ephesus and doing some deep teaching and some deep ministry. And he stayed there so long that the very... Uh, fabric of the community gets shaken here. We're going to read on in the book of Acts chapter 19. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. Now, the way is a nickname for the church. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The early believers in Jesus were called followers of the way. And there was a disturbance about this. A silversmith named Demetrius. Paul would have a problem with metal workers, okay? He says in another, uh, another epistle, Alexander the coppersmith has done me much harm. What did metal workers have against Paul? Well, we're going to see. Uh, they made silver shrines for Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together along with the workers in related trades and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is a danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. 
and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. Now I have met Artemis, also known as Diana. I met her in Rome in the Vatican Museum. Here she is right here. And they, they believe that Zeus dropped this image down from heaven so that they could have this amazing temple to, to Artemis. And all that on her front are the many breasts that signify her provision for the people that would worship her. And so people would come in and they would worship at this temple, which was huge, uh, one of the wonders of the ancient world. And then what do you do? You visit the souvenir shop, okay? And you can take home a little image of Diana, uh, of Artemis, and you would set up a little shrine in your home, you know, and put a little arch over it and, you know, and put some little flowers and light a little candle and, and uh, you know, and, and leave a little food offering or whatever and tell Diana what you need, tell Artemis what you need. And that was part of this, part, part of the worship that was the center of, of Ephesus. What was happening through the preaching of the gospel is sales were down. Uh, of these little trinkets and these charms. Uh, Paul was teaching about a faith in a God that we don't, can't confine to an image and his son, Jesus Christ. And so this was the nature of the riot that is gonna break out. Let's read. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, uh, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Anybody ever been to Ephesus in here? Here we got some people that have been to Ephesus. I bet you visited the, the amphitheater that is there. There's a picture of it. Uh, it, is, it could seat 25,000 people. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's an amazing space. People started to flood into the theater there in Ephesus, shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Let's read on. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. So there's got all these people, thousands of people there. Paul wants to go address them. Is this a good idea? This is not a good idea. Really, no, 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 no. You're not going to do this. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there, which is often how it is in a crowd. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front and they shouted instructions instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. You know, here's the thing about Paul. The pagans thought he was a Jew and the Jews thought he was a pagan. No, nobody knew what to make of him. And so uh, the synagogue people are getting involved in this. But when they realized he was a Jew, they shouted all in unison for about two, can you imagine this, two hours. Great is Diana, of, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk, here the voice of reason is going to step up after two hours, quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls, they can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting because of what's happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. If there's one thing the Romans valued, it was what they called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And uh, we're, we're not going to do business. We're going to do things in an orderly way. And this city clerk is saying, hey, we need to, we need to, we need to calm down here. Now, um, you know, Acts is a sampler of what happened in each city, but it's not the whole history. We see there's much more, when we read the letters and things, we get a, a clearer picture. Uh, I'm reading, I, I mentioned, I'm reading the uh, biography of Paul by uh, N.T. Wright, which some say is the greatest interpreter of Paul of our day, uh, arguably, and uh, Anglican. And, uh, and he, he asserts, his study has yielded that Paul was in prison in Ephesus. We don't get that from Luke in Acts, but uh, he says that Paul was probably imprisoned at this time and wrote four of his prison letters uh, to other churches uh, from, from Ephesus. 
Um, sometimes we see about the commotion like this riot going on, but we need to also take into account that Paul is leading a group of Christians, and he's also leading other Christians. He's getting reports in from places like Corinth, which he visited on his first missionary journey, and that Apollos had visited too. And one of the things he's getting from the church at Corinth is that uh, they've had a falling out with Paul. And some are saying, well, enough with Paul. We like, we like Apollos, or we like Peter, some of these other guys that travel through. And Paul writes to the Corinthians, he said, uh, some of you are saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of, I'm, I'm of Cephas. Say, so who are we? We're all servants of Christ, and Christ is not divided. It's clear that Paul had a major falling out with the Christians at Corinth. And uh, he wrote to them what Paul calls a painful letter. Now, some people think the painful letter is 1 Corinthians because 1 Corinthians has a lot of corrections in it. There was a dude that married his stepmom and Paul had a lot of corrections for them. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of it would say the painful letter was another letter that we've lost. It's lost to history. We don't, we don't have that. But we know that Paul did eventually reconcile with the church at Corinth. And he wrote the letter, what we have is 2 Corinthians. And it is probably, um, you know, probably the cheeriest letter of Paul is Philippians, even though it was written from prison. Probably the darkest of Paul's letters and the most personal of Paul's letters is 2 Corinthians. And he's kind of reconciled with these people. The relationship is restored. And he takes some time just to say why he does, why, what he does, and what motivates him. And I just want to read a few verses from 2 Corinthians. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Uh, he says, it's silly to boast about what you've done, but I'm going to do it anyway here. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this, he says. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That, that's, a, that's interesting because when Luke talks about Paul getting kicked out of the synagogue, he doesn't say what happened there. But here from Paul we get, they didn't just say don't come back, they beat him. And the Jewish law allowed them to beat somebody up to 40 times. That was the maximum. But being good Pharisees and legalists, they backed it off one and they, and they had 39. Five times he, he received the maximum sentence of 39 uh, beatings, 39 lashes. Okay. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger of the country, in danger at sea. You ever heard the prosperity gospel that says if you just trust Jesus, everything's going to go great? And in danger from false believers, I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. Paul would say in some of his letters, I arrived to you in weakness. And I think what he means by that is he arrived with a black eye and a bloody nose from getting beaten in the last place that he was. And yet God's grace pours out through his life and touches people and transforms the message of the gospel goes forward. Jesus said at his conversion, he told Ananias, I'll show him how much he must suffer for my, for my sake. And Paul would say, uh, no one trouble me any longer. I bear in my body the marks of, of Jesus Christ. You know, we have a letter to the Ephesians. And it's, I, there's always debate about the letters of Paul. You know, there's always some scholar that comes out and say, well, Paul didn't really write this because it's a different style. And it is true that Ephesus is different than a lot of the other letters because they're so polished. It's such a beautiful, it's so beautifully written, his letter to the Ephesians. Contrast that with Galatians, you know. His letter to the Galatians, it's like firing off a letter, you know. Probably like an email that should have said in the draft folder one more night before you send it kind of thing. You know, maybe I'll take out that line about I hope they emasculate 
emasculate themselves or, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, it has that raw edge to it. And if, you don't get that in Ephesians. It's so, it's so beautifully written and so polished. And well, some of the difference with Paul's letters is Paul didn't write most, any of these really. He dictated them. So Timothy wrote this one as he dictated. Aristarchus wrote this one as he dictated. So that, that accounts for some matters of style. But I think what we have in Ephesus, his letter to the Ephesians, I think what we have is a summary of his teaching over those two years. I really think that's what Ephesians is. And uh, Watchman Nee, over 100 years ago, wrote a, a study of the book of Ephesians, and he used three words to describe uh, Paul's teaching there to the church at Ephesus. And one word is set. He wanted to let them know we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are exalted with him. We, are, we, he, we have been brought into fellowship with Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is exalted. Therefore, we are free to live an exalted life. Spiritually speaking, we are enthroned with Christ. The second word that defines the book of uh, Ephesians is walk. We walk in righteousness. We walk in Christ. We walk in the power of the spirit. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And the third word that defines the book of Ephesians is stand. You know, we have that amazing sixth chapter where Paul talks about the full armor of God that we're to wear. And he says, hey, having done all, stand. And when you can't do anything else, stand, stand. So you're seated with Christ, so walk with Christ. And having done everything else, um, stand with Christ. That's the, that's the life that we're called to in the power of the Holy Spirit. I tell you what, we're going to sing here in just a minute. And um, uh, let's do this. Let's do this. As we sing that last song, uh, if you'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit today, would you come on down? And Alpha team, I haven't asked you this in advance. Would you be willing to pray for people? You're, you're fresh off our Holy Spirit weekend. They're going to lay hands on your shoulder, ask that the Holy Spirit would fill you. Uh, let's stand and let's, uh, let's invite the Holy Spirit to be among us. Lord God, we thank you that we live an overcoming life, not an easy life in Jesus, but a life that is filled with your overcoming power. And Paul would write to Rome and he would say, uh, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Tribulation or distress or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, nothing can separate us from the love of God. We, we are alive in the spirit and we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Lord God, we need the Spirit. The first thing that Paul preached to the Ephesians is you need the Holy Spirit. If you're gonna live this life for Jesus, you can't do it on your own strength. You can't do it on your own steam. You're gonna need the power of the Holy Spirit to fill you with joy and peace and unction so that you can live this life, this new life in Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, would you come even this morning to every heart that wants to be filled in your holy name, amen.